Hey everybody, um, I wanted to do a video on uh, Jars of Clay's first record, another one. <laughs> uh, this one's just me talking about what I've learned as I've, I've gone through it. Um, I started watching um, Rick Beato's music channel and he is a really well-versed music theory person as well as a longtime uh, producer. Um, he did records with the band Shinedown and um, is a very big Nirvana fan and um, likes I mean, he breaks down a lot of most of the songs he's taking apart has lately taken apart I mean there's he, he's probably only has thousands yet to go but he um, has a series called what makes this song great and it's really cool because he digs into the music theory of what makes a song great um, just how musically complex it is I mean he's able to dig in and explain all that because of his, um, his study in theory um, I did a little bit of study in theory myself when I took Jars of Clay's first record apart and put it back together. I was fortunate enough to find someone who had explained that the tuning for the guitars on the first record is E, A, B, E, B, E, going from the lowest to the highest string. So you get something like... Instead of standard. Um, since the uh, sheet music book was originally published for standard tuning, um, which was pretty much also a single guitar. Um, you had something to go on, certainly, and and a lot of what happens in the music is in the, is in the piano notes. If you look, the the string parts and the pan flutes and all that are in there, um, which is nice. I mean, if you could you could if someone who knows transcription could potentially take the piano music and separate it out onto the proper staffs that pan flutes and um, violins are written on and be able to uh, accurately uh, transcribe uh, their own version of sheet music for those instruments, I think, um, to a certain extent. Um, so that's great. But the book never offered what the alternate tuning was. Um, I don't know how the person who figured it out figured it out, but I'm glad they did. Um, and then people figured out capo on the third for the because a lot of the songs were in the key of G, um, so that was good. So I could go back and re-examine the chords that the book offered and, and, with, and apply the alternate tuning to them, and then kind of, how does that, but I had to understand something. I had to understand that chords were made up of notes, like say a root, a third, and a fifth, um, or if a major seventh would be a root, a third, a fifth, and a seventh note um, with a major chord, you know, um, so, so that was cool, um, to go back and look at all that stuff, and I went through each song, and I did a tab map for what each chord would be, in the alternate tuning, and that doesn't mean I came up, it was exactly what the band did, but I was a lot closer, um, excuse me, uh, to, to actually being able to play the music correctly, um, so that was great. And then there were some other folks' videos out there who had um, uh, played with the alternate tuning. Like there was a guy who'd, who'd figured out how to play like a child. There was um, the guy, Colin Sexton, who had done his own uh, performance of Worlds Apart. And he played it in the alternate tuning. And it sounded just like what Steve Mason did on the live shows uh, when they played it live. Um, so that was really great. So all those combined resources were able to help me make my tutorial videos that I came up with. Uh, for the uh, songs um, So uh, So that was that was pretty neat. I mean it had been 20 years and I was finally playing these songs More accurately than I ever had before um, of one of my favorite bands uh, music um, But let me read you my my thing that I made um, my, my long thing that I came up with let's see um Okay, one argument for learning music theory is getting into a band like Jars of Clay, haha. Ha. They used an odd tuning, E-A-B-E-B-E, -B -E -B -E, on the first record. The cool thing about this tuning is that when you use it, you can now do chords much more easily on the guitar. In most cases, the tuning helps remove the third note out of every chord. Um, example, e, an E major chord in a, in a tab map format goes from zero three three two zero zero to zero two zero 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 zero. Technically you're playing an E5 chord. 
the E major chord is made up of the notes, an E, an e major chord is made up of the notes E plus G sharp plus B. E5 is only E plus B. Your E major is your E major's total tab map notes look like, on the on the guitar look like E B E G sharp B and E in standard tuning. With the alternate tuning, the notes are from lowest to highest string are E B B E B and E. So that's a, so that's an E five because it doesn't violate the rule of what a fifth is. A fifth a fifth is made up of the root and the fifth note only. So that's what makes a fifth note of, a fifth chord a fifth chord. Um, a fifth chord is also what we call back in the I don't know how long it goes far it goes back but power chords. Um, so anyway, fifth chords like an E five are known as power chords. Kurt Cobain and many other rockers use use or use them. Kurt claimed that they made guitar playing easy since one can maintain the same shape with their hands and slide up or down the strings to find the chords they want. Also, dropping one's e, low E string to D makes it even easier, and this dropping drops string this drops string tuning gets known as grunge tuning in the 90s. This in no way diminishes Kurt's overall musical genius, as Rick has proven in his videos on Nirvana's songs. One could say these chords open up the possibilities to let vocals or other instruments fill in the thirds to dictate whether the overall chord the combined band is producing is major, minor, etc. This open tuning allows one to play power chords using more strings and gaining a fuller sound and possibly making a guitar easier still for a novice to begin playing. Excuse me. I believe Jars used it because it fit the musical climate of the times, 1995, and it just worked for them. They end up using it along with the capo on the third fret to write to write seven out of ten of their songs on that first record. Well, I guess eight because I think only Liquid and Blind don't use that tuning, I think. Actually, I'm kind of wondering if Liquid uses the tuning as well. I, that way there was that video that Jars of them playing in that cafe like well they're still in maybe maybe they were still in college or they just gotten the record deal or something um, but they're playing like a coffee house version of liquid and from what i can tell steve mason is playing all his shapes are are what you would use if you were in standard tuning and matt odemark is playing whatever he's playing i almost need to watch the video again it's been that long for me to if i really want to even try to comprehend that <laughs> um anyway so anyway, my own personal story going on. I become a fan of the band. I enjoy the vocal harmonies, many odd instruments like unconventional percussion, pan flutes, heavy reliance on acoustic strum driven guitars, and string parts. I later conclude that the record has a bit of every musical style in it that was present at the time of its release, 1995. Hip hop beats, country like fiddle parts, alternative overall style. The band was big on Toad the Wet Sprocket and one could argue that Dan's vocal style was very like the lead singer of Toad. Toad. He changed it on their second record and didn't go back. Anyway, but also strong classical classical music styles, uh, Baroque, Gregorian, the Gregorian chant that they used in it, um, uh, potentially stuff that maybe Johann Sebastian Bach would have wrote, things like that. Um, yeah, but also, anyway, strong classical musical influence and even Beatles-like sh string, string part writing as well. Example, the song Blind is Jar's version of Eleanor Rigby. The sheet music book is written in piano vo chord vocal format. The chords given are thankfully mapped in the traditional blocks with the dots down where to press the strings and with the chord name letters above. At this time, I only at the time that I began learning learning the, the songs from this album, I only knew only knew G major, C major, and D major chords. I had no grasp of alternate tunings for years to come. I hadn't even begun how to learn how to read guitar tablature yet. I also have no music theory knowledge and have the ability of probably what would be a six months year old to read notes, let alone letters. <laughs> Well, anyway, I couldn't, I didn't know. It was, I compared it to being barely able to read the alphabet. Um, um, 
a six month old to read notes, then I make a comment about how lucky the uh, Rick, Rick uh, Beato's son is to have him for a father. Um, but anyway. So anyway, I'm into the band, but not a serious musician, still true. So I learned some of what the book offers. I learned a way to play the song entitled Love Song for a Savior that I later make a YouTube tutorial video for that, that which has been watched over 1,200 times so far. I know for sure that they are not all my own personal reviewings and can therefore conclude that my video was of service to my fellow fans. I believe the song may still get played in church services for worship. The reason that I think the video has been helpful is that I am playing the song in standard tuning rather than the alternate that the band originally used. I help spare someone the hassle of learning foreign fingerings by playing the song in a familiar way and not having to tune their guitar to this odd tuning that they may not use on a regular basis in most of their playing. I've since gone back and discovered a way to play, play it still using a capo on the third fret, but again not using the alternate tuning. So that's been neat. Someone out there on the internet figured out the alternate tuning the band used, and I went back and re-examined the chords in the book, applying the alternate tuning to them. I then made videos on how to play the songs using the alternate tuning. I'm now playing songs like Worlds Apart much closer to the way Jars did originally, and was excited to play it at my church later on, say during a communion service. I am glad to have finally grasped how one of my favorite bands went about making their music after 20 plus years of listening. The band still fascinates me. The way Matt and Steve play guitar together is something I can't grasp still. Arg. Um, listen to the Republic Tigers too. Um, so anyway, it was, that was my 20 year journey with Jars of Clay's music. Um, I still like the first record. I still like to listen to the first record. I still like to play the songs from the first record. I have a guitar tuned and ready in that alternate tuning so I can just kind of at a moment's notice pull out that guitar out of its case and, and play those songs um, uh, whenever I want to, along with my other acoustic guitar and that's in standard and my electric guitar that's also in standard. Um, so it's, it's I mean, I, I did have to sort of feel my way around the tuning and, and figure out what was going on and eventually get to the point where, I mean, I can pretty much sit down and play most of the, the entire album now, so that's great. Um, I mean, definitely, like, Flood is definitely the one that the tuning unlocks, you know. songs too. I can play, like I said, just anything, almost anything from the record. shapes work and what they do. Um. here. Um, 
and D. Where's that harmonic? That G suspended that was written in the sheet music to be played as a chord is actually played as a harmonic. It makes a G suspended chord when you hit that harmonic on the what is the one, two, three, four, fifth fret relative. If I can hit it, I, I don't know, these strings are dead and some other issues with this guitar, but um, all that, but um, yeah, so I mean, like I said, it's, if you want further detail, watch my tutorial videos. Um, I've, in terms of Love Song for a Savior, I've taken it apart and put it back together. Standard tuning with no capo, standard, standard tuning with a capo on the third fret, alternate tuning with capo on the third fret. Um, so, I mean, I've given people the three different ways to play Love Song for a Savior, and there's actually videos. Love Song for Savior was big, and there was another guy who did a great performance video of him playing it in the alternate tuning. It was, you know, sounds almost perfect. It's just the only thing that's missing is Jar's singing, and he sings pretty well on it, so that's good. Um, but anyway, if anybody has anything they want to add to this conversation, uh, go ahead. Um, it's just, it's been fun to be able to produce these videos and be able to finally play. Like 20 years ago, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just kind of held the instrument in my lap and was like, wow, what am I, how am I going to play this? And I felt so limited or I'd bump into a new chord and then I had to learn how to play a bar chord and stuff. And I was like, oh gosh. And just making myself go through that process. It was definitely kind of a crucible that I had to put myself through in order to get to where I had, there was definitely work involved and I had to pull the inner musician out of myself and make him known, in order to make him known. So, um, yeah, so good stuff. And uh, please, please enjoy the rest of my videos and, and comment and like and subscribe to my channel. Um, I have do have a Patreon uh, now that you can donate as little as $1 a month to. If all my now 113 subscribers would donate $1, that would be $113 a month in income. That would, of course, make my life a little easier and, and motivate me to make more tutorials. I have plans for hundreds of videos in the future. I don't, there's no, this is something I can probably do for the rest of my life. So, um, yeah, please, please, uh, please donate if you can. If you can't, that's cool. I'm just asking, and of course, uh, like I said, only one dollar a month if you can do that. If you, and uh, that's it. So anyway, thanks a lot.